Well, hello and welcome to part 13 of this walkthrough. Although the game itself is now over, the game L, a mathematical adventure for the BBC Micro. I've said that every time. Um, uh, why not? Why not? Why not be clear and upfront about what this these videos have all been about, what each video is actually about? Um, the game itself is over. We've played through it. We've won. We've rescued Runia. Uh, the game is actually quite kind. You can't die in the game if you make a bad mistake. I don't think you can get stuck. Although, as I say, I do wonder what happens if you drink the potions the um, from the bottle in the phial too early. Does height, altered height, prevent you from doing certain things? Can you, in fact, row across the river if you're smaller because you're lighter? I don't know. Does it matter that there are several breaches of logic and a lot of um, uh, crimes against mimesis, I believe the technical term is, in this game? Uh, I don't think so, because it is, after all, a, a game for kids, a game to teach kids about uh, maths, primarily. And because it's a game primarily to teach kids about maths, it's got a lot of different mathematical-based puzzles, mathematics-based puzzles, um, sort of strewn around the terrain of the game, and without much attempt, if any, to sort of tie them into a meaningful whole. Although, of course, then, you know, is, that's also rather unfair because, for example, the tree planting puzzle uh, where we had to plant ten rows of three trees for a gardener after having crossed the river in a tin bath is, uh, there is an attempt there to tie that in. I mean, how a computer later on fits into this world, this um, surreal world of L, uh, I couldn't say. I couldn't say, but... Um, uh, it's there, and it kind of works. I mean, I mean, the, the, the sort of uh, hodgepodgeness of it, the uh, messiness of it, kind of works. And uh, yes, you don't mind so much. I mean, especially I do remember, uh, you know, when I played this at school, as a child at school uh, in a group, um, when I played this game on the venerable BBC Micro at school, we um, didn't mind, and we had fun, and it was a challenge. And I'm sure some of us were better at some of the puzzles than others. And it, uh, it, it, you know, replaying this game many years later has shown me that memory is very erratic. And uh, I thought I had quite a good memory, but in fact, there's so much I can't remember. I mean, and you would say, well, why would you? It's, it's such a trivial part of your life and it's uh, an adventure game. But something about it clearly stayed with me because... It's because um, I'm playing it all these years later and wittering on about it for hours. Literally hours. I can't believe it. Um, but there it is. Um, so it, it, it worked. It, it did something right. And uh, I've remembered uh, many things about it. Um, I just put up the picture of the Gustav Doré engraving from the very first part that I mentioned in the very first part of the walkthrough again just for... Uh, something to show you really um uh, is there anything else i can show you there's the um the only picture i could find of the manual to l um it's from the archive from the internet archive archive.org because the website which was a nottingham university website uh, which must somehow have been affiliated with the association of teachers of mathematics who wrote this game originally for the bbc micro their website, uh, th those web pages no longer are accessible, except through the Internet Archive. And therefore, the picture I've got of the manual is incredibly uh, pixelated and low resolution. But I think you can see, nonetheless, that it is a copy of the Gustave Dor Doré engraving. And it, 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 it sets the scene. Yeah, even though I said it promises more than the game delivers, it does set the scene... Um, for uh, the adventure and, and, you know, it sort of gets you thinking about the setting and the environment you're about to enter. Um, 
So L was written in BASIC, and, and that's also quite impressive, I think. Um, uh, clearly there were irritations because the vocabulary was small, the syntax was uh, left something to be desired, let's say. But it worked. I mean, it did the job. And, you know, the, the minimum, the very basic two-word parser, which didn't allow you to examine objects or look at them uh, consistently, um, was enough to get you through. Uh, some odd syntax was required at times. But it was done in that way. The program was written in that way because memory was an issue. Um, mode 7 had to be used to um, allow you know, the Beeb to provide the programmer with more memory because Mode 7 uses less RAM um, and so for display. Mode 7 is a uh, graphics display mode on the BBC Micro. And it leaves more RAM free for the program, for the user program in memory. And that's why they used mode 7, because there are other modes which either provide more columns of text or more colors, but I think um, mode 7 was used, and, and it was commonly used for text adventures, actually, on the BBC Micro, because it does use less memory. And here you can, this is mode 7, here we are. And you can see uh, there are very few uh, columns of uh, text available for the display, but the text is clear. I, I do like the old Mode 7 font. Um, odd and kind of blocky though it is. Uh, it's clear, it's quite clear, and I like that. Um, so that's why Mode 7 was used. Um, the sp and the graphics, there were some graphics in the game. Uh, particularly, I suppose, the key puzzle. In fact, were they the only graphics in the game that we've seen? Yes, I think they were, uh, apart from the loading page. Um, but that was well done. And a good use of Mode 7 graphics, which can be awkward. There are all sorts of uh, character control codes that need to be actually placed on screen to change colour and things like that. Uh, so with the limitations of Mode 7 graphics, I think they did quite well to create a, uh, a quite involved and uh, sophisticated, uh, relatively, puzzle. Uh, the speed of execution of the program was also acceptable, you know. I thought that might actually be too slow for toleration. Um, but because I'm such a shambolic uh, walkthrougher, uh, it didn't matter because I needed time to actually think of what to say. And it's the first time I've done a walkthrough, so please forgive me. My sins against comprehension and interestingness and lucidity. But uh, that was okay. And, and this is an unspeeded up beep. So this is a, a beep as fast as it would originally have been. Um, and it was fine, I thought, actually, to play along with. Another point I wanted to mention was to ask a question, how much math did this game actually teach? Well, I think I've said several times, the teacher really needs to supervise this and provide explanations of the mathematical problems involved and uh, expand on the um, mathematical concepts you encounter and even teach you new concepts you might not have uh, learned before. Uh, in order to help you solve the puzzles in the game. And there's, uh, you know, plenty of potential for follow-up work. It, it's, it, it is, it's packed. And I don't actually know of another Beep game that is as full of mathematical problems and of, of so many problems... Um, an educational game of this kind. This may be one of the few examples of one that's full of uh, ideas and full of problems. I'm just trying to think. There, there was another game by um, Peter Kilworth, who wrote many text adventure games, but he also, uh, many complicated ones, which weren't necessarily what you might call educational or edutainment. That word didn't exist. Um, but he wrote a game called Jack the Giant Killer, or just Giant Killer. I, I think that may originally have been uh, for the BBC Micro, but he's n there's now a uh, PC version of it. 
which you can play. And that's also very good. That's very mathsy and um, interesting and, and tricky and cunning as well. Uh, and that reminds me of L, actually. That's the first time I've made the connection, even though it's quite obvious, between those two games. So uh, there's a tradition of such games on the BBC Micro, it seems. Uh, but I don't know of any other, uh, apart from L and Giant Killer, that are uh, of this quality. Uh, you know, having so many puzzles uh, that have a potential to be followed up and teach uh, children uh, a lot about maths. Another technical point I wanted to mention was, yes, games did used to come on big floppy disks with right protect sticky labels, and I just can't believe that um, that was allowed to happen. I mean, a sticky label on a disk which you then insert into a very narrow slot in a mechanical, electromechanical drive that will read it. I mean, just asking for trouble, isn't it? I mean, Im imagine the nightmare you'd have if a sticky label came off in your... CD-ROM drive or DVD drive, you know, you know, and yet we used to happily um, shove these things into our disk drives back in the day. Um, yes, right, protect labels. There is a final question I wanted to ask. Um, why is this game called L? I don't know. Is there an obvious answer that I'm missing here? Is, it, is there something obvious? Why is it called L? Why? Is it simply because there's an L-shaped maze and an L-shaped room uh, in the game, but an L-shaped maze on the loading screen? That can't be it. I mean, it's not sufficient. Um, anyway, uh, I don't know. Uh, tell me if you do know. And tell me if um, you have any comments at all on this walkthrough. Uh, I'd be happy to hear them or read them. And... Um, uh, tell me what you thought, and have you played the game? Did you enjoy the game when, when you originally played it back in the day? Or are you a recent discoverer of the game L, a mathematical adventure? Um, let me know. Uh, I did enjoy the game. I want to finally end with that, because I've made a lot of snide comments about the game in an attempt to be either facetious or interesting or entertaining or amusing. I don't think I was any of those things, but, um, well, facetious, certainly. Um, but I do enjoy it, and I hope that's clear, and um, I don't want anyone to think that uh, I've just done this to take the mickey out of the game, because that certainly wasn't my intention. I think it's uh, a, a quite a good game as a game, even. I, again, the puzzle festiness, uh, the fact that it's a puzzle fest, it gets away with. Um... Because the puzzles are in are are of enough interest to keep you going, to um, hold your interest and make you want to finish the game. They're not they're not totally irritating, even though I've described them uh, tongue in cheek as irritating. Some of the puzzles uh, they are uh, intriguing enough to make you want to finish the whole game. And the narrative, such as it is, threadbare as it is, is also. Not bad, in a way. I mean, it's it's a standard quest narrative, but it, 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 it's such a mishmash. It even sort of vaguely reminds me of Doctor Who, actually, with these robots uh, flying around this castle in an uh, incompetent way. I mean, easily defeated. Uh, it reminds me a bit of the Daleks. Uh, just go up the stairs and uh, you're free, you know, uh, that kind of thing. Um, am I reaching there? Possibly, possibly. But maybe it's my affection and nostalgia is uh, overwhelming all my... Uh, critical faculties but I did like the game and I did enjoy it and thanks to the Association of Teachers of Mathematics who made it possible I'll provide links to all the other um, things of interest that I've mentioned in the walkthroughs and especially to uh, the BBEM emulator and the uh, walkthrough by Darren Izzard and the map by Nick Murdoch um, they were all invaluable and uh, that's pretty much the end of this walkthrough. Thanks for listening and watching if you have. And if you haven't, uh, you're very sensible. Thank you and goodbye.